Great. All right, we can get started. So um, actually, I think Yi Song has been assigned hosting to do. So I think I'll let him do the introduction. And uh, I don't think Yi Song, you had a chance to introduce yourself. So please go ahead. Oh, yeah, great. So uh, hello, everyone. I'm Yi Song from uh, Wing Group. I'm advised by Prof Ming. I'm a first, a first year PhD student at NOS. Uh, my focus is on NLP. Uh, so today I'm, I'm great honor to uh, in, to have her, her with us today uh, for our NLP seminar. Uh, so He He is an assistant professor in the Center for Data Science and current institute at New York University. Before joining NYU, she spent a year at Amazon Web Services and was a postdoc at Stanford University. She received her PhD from University of Maryland a college pop. She's broadly interested in machine learning and natural language processing. Her current research interests include text generation, dialogue systems, and robust language understanding. So uh, please join me and uh, welcome to our seminar. Yeah. Thanks for the introduction. So. Okay. Uh, yeah, I guess we can uh, get started. Um, so for so if you have questions, feel free to interrupt in the middle uh, or just type in the chat window. So uh, yeah, as, uh, as mentioned, I'm very glad to give a talk to our recent work in robust natural language understanding today. So as we all know with this um, pre-trained models, we have seen amazing results on leaderboards. And I think right now, we're currently really struggling building benchmarks that are difficult enough for our models. However, if we start to play with these models or put them into production settings, we quickly find that they make catastrophic errors and that are really don't make sense to humans. So here's uh, this well-known example in reading comprehension uh, where the task is to answer, to extract a answer span from the paragraph given this question. So we can see that even though the model makes a correct prediction here, but it can be easily distracted by uh, this appended distracting sentence, which mentions about a quarterback draft in address number 37 in champ ball, which is not, even though it has large overlap with the question, but it's not really uh, answering this question, but then the model still changed its prediction. And also in this recent, um, actually last year, checklist paper, through the behavior testing, we can see that even when we uh, perturb the sentence to generate some natural and benign distribution shift, like changing from I recommend the food to I can't say I recommend the food, um, the model will change its predictions in unexpected ways that doesn't make sense to humans. And finally, this phenomenon is definitely not unique to uh, NLP, but a more fundamental problem in uh, statistical learning models. So in this convergent example, um, so the model predicts this image as um, wolf instead of a husky, which is the uh, ground truth. And then if we really look into why the model is making such a prediction, we can see that the model is focusing on the background, uh, the background snow to uh, associate with this wolf. And the common problem in all these examples is that the model relies on some simple superficial heuristics to make the prediction uh, that takes the shortcuts instead of um, reasoning like humans do. So here to make it more precise by experience correlations, what we mean in the context of this talk is that um, there are predictive rules that work for certain data sets but do not hold in general. So let's look at two examples in NLP that I will also uh, refer to often in the rest of this talk. The first is textual entailment, where the task is to predict whether uh, a premise sentence like a love docs entails or contradicts a hypothesis sentence like I don't love dogs. So our benchmarks, MLI and SNLI, people have found that the model can associate negation words in the hypothesis with a label contradiction because that happens to uh, work on the, our benchmarks. However, we can easily come up with uh, current examples uh, such as I don't love cats, even though there's negation word, but the label is not contradiction. And similarly, in paraphrase identification, we so our benchmark QP, we see that whenever two sentences 
have the same bag of words, such as cats live in Sweden in 1947 versus cats live in 1947 in Sweden. So these two are semantically equivalent. However, again, we can come up with counter examples where the two sentences has 100% overlap in terms of uh, bag of words, but they actually mean different things, such as a good person becomes bad doesn't really mean a bad person becomes good. So these are examples where uh, the spurious correlations that work on data set does not uh, hold true when we actually deploy the model into the real world. Okay, so why do we have this spurious correlations in the data? One prominent source in NLP is the so-called annotation bias. So if we think about how this uh, textual entailment data is collected, um, basically the process is we show the talker some premise sentence and ask them to write a sentence that is definitely true or not true given the premise. So in this case, a easy way to produce a contradicting sentence is just to negate the premise, which is why, uh, which, which is uh, one potential reason uh, why we see this uh, negation bias in NLI. Now, even if we fix the annotation bias, it's still possible to have sparse correlations just because our data distribution is um, skewed. For example, uh, when we retrieve photos from uh, internet, it's probably true that we do see uh, wolves in snow more often than wolves in the grass. However, even though this is the minority case, we still want to guarantee performance in this group because of various reasons such as fairness or uh, safety. So to summarize the key problem here is that our data doesn't have enough coverage over all the predicted patterns that we want to learn. Okay, so the problem set up in the rest of this talk is that there is, um, so in our data set, there is some heuristics that works for the majority of the examples, but there are also a minority group uh, that, that counters this uh, spurious correlation. So we want to learn a model that's robust to this uh, spurious correlation and generalize better to out of distribution data. And I will specifically talk about uh, three works, all focus on different ways of making better use of this uh, minority examples in our data set. The first is um, residual fitting, where we try to focus our learning uh, from these minority examples instead of the majority ones, which suffers from spurious correlations. And the second is a uh, model tasking, where we transfer knowledge from related tasks to improve generalization of these minority examples. And the third part is, um, data augmentation where we analyze uh, the effectiveness of augmenting examples similar to the minority examples. Okay, so is the setup clear before I move on to the first part? Yeah, I think it's quite clear. I think everyone is okay. familiar with uh, all three of these uh, techniques because uh, there's quite a lot of research also at NUS on these. So this is great. Okay. Cool. All right. So the first work is on uh, learned data set bias by fitting the residual, which is uh, John Chris Chang and Hao Han. So let's first um, think about this problem from the distribution shift uh, perspective. So here, uh, we assume that our data can be decomposed into the robust features and the spurious features. Uh, so in the connect, uh, so in the example of NLI, basically uh, the robust features would be the meaning or semantics of sentence and the spurious feature, let's say in terms of negation bias would be some negation words. And the, we can write this strongly distribution as uh, a, conditional distribution of the robust feature given the label and the joint distribution of the uh, spurious feature and the label assuming uh, these two are independent. So the first term here uh, is invariant. So this robust, the relationship between the robust feature and the label does not change uh, across different domains or environments. Uh, the second part, the joint distribution between the spurious feature and the label can change at this time. So if the model relies on this feature, uh, it would suffer if there's a uh, distribution shift. So now if you can disentangle the robust features and spurious features, then the problem is basically solved because uh, we could just learn uh, the model using only the robust features. But this disentanglement is also a very challenging problem. But fortunately, we do have some domain knowledge of the spurious features given a specific task. 
for example, in NLP, um, it's possible that the lengths or specific words in the example are spiritually correlated with the label. So the key idea here is that maybe if we could uh, recognize the spirit features, then we could learn from examples where the spirit feature and the label are independent. Okay, so using the negation bias example, suppose we know that there, there's, there is some correlation between negation words and the label, uh, uh, and this will change at test times the spirit correlation. Um, ideally, we would like examples where given that there is some negation word in the hypothesis, um, the distribution of the label is balanced. So then that means this negation word is not really predictive of the labels and the model wouldn't learn that. Um, but in our benchmark, because of uh, an either annotation bias or selection bias, what we see is that the first pattern is the majority. So the model really latches onto this, uh, uh, this spirits feature. So now if we can identify that these two examples doesn't suffer from uh, spirits correlation, we could actually try to focus learning on this subset of uh, examples. So the way we detect these two examples is through uh, a bias classifier. So we could, so if we know this bias feature, we could build a model that only uses the biased features. So in this case, if the model, this biased model predicts correctly um, this example, that means uh, the spurious feature is very predictive here. So we don't really want to learn from this to avoid the spurious correlation and we could focus on the, uh, the latter two cases. Okay, so now let's uh, try to formalize that uh, uh, intuition. So we propose this uh, residual fitting algorithm, which uh, learn a device model in two steps. So in the first step, our goal is to identify this uh, clean examples. So we build a bias classifier using known spurious features. So the, uh, the input of this bias classifier could be just negation words or uh, like the hypothesis for texture entailment. So this FS is the uh, bias classifier and we learn that by standard uh, empirical risk minimization. Then in the second step, we would like to learn the device classifier by fitting the residual of the first classifier. Um, and by fitting the residual, what I mean is that we, uh, the output would be the sum of the bias classifier and the device classifier. And in the second stage of the learning, uh, the bias classifier output is fixed. So we don't really update parameters of uh, this classifier. So intuitively, this bias classifier would have very low loss on examples where the spurious feature is predictive. And then this device features would instead focus on uh, predicting what, uh, predicting uh, examples where the spurious, predicting examples where the spurious feature uh, is not predictive. So we try to capture information that is not um, expressed in the spurious correlations. Okay, so now if we just um, uh, replace this loss function with the standard uh, cross entropy loss used in classification problems, uh, it's also pretty straightforward. In the first step, we learn the bias classifier. Then in the second step, we sum the logits from the uh, two classifiers. Uh, and we can also easily show that the alpha distribution would be proportional to the product of the output of the biased classifier and the device one. And at inference time, we would throw away this bias model and only use this uh, device classifier. Okay, so then we can also do some simple gradient analysis to show that this algorithm actually does what we uh, intended it to do. So we show that in the second um, in the second stage, this residual fitting uh, stage, uh, the gradient can be expressed as the sum of the MLE gradient and a bias correction gradient. Um, and in one case where the spurious feature is very predictive, so here, uh, if we just use the negation words as the spurious feature, uh, we can see that in this case, so suppose the bias classifier gives a perfect prediction. So the probability of the ground truth example uh, is close to one. Then we can show that this bias correction gradient cancels MLE gradient. So we basically have zero gradient on this example, which is equivalent to simply removing this example. And in the other case, 
if the bias classifier is not predictive at all, meaning that it outputs a uniform or uninformative prediction. In this case, we can show that in the second stage, uh, this uh, gradient step recovers the original MLE gradients, which means we just do a normal update on this example. Okay, so that shows that uh, we, we try to mainly do our update on the clean unbiased examples, given our prior knowledge of the existing sparse correlation in the data. So, and we tried this algorithm um, on the NLI data set, the MLI data set. And we target, so one important um, ingredient in, in this algorithm is that we assume some prior knowledge of the sparse correlation. So here we, we target the hypothesis bias and word overlap bias in this data. And our uh, bias model and device model have the same parameter transition. The only difference is the input feature. So for the bias model, we only give it, let's say, uh, negation words for the word overlap rate. And then we tried uh, three different models. So BERT, uh, I think everybody knows that. And then we also tried two um, non pretrained models. And we compare our algorithm with uh, the MLE algorithm. Okay, so first we uh, studied this uh, synthetic spheres feature. So we insert a cheating label to the, prep, uh, to the hypothesis of a training example. So the cheating label equals low label with some probability, which is the uh, cheating rate. And at test time, this cheating label is randomly assigned from uh, the three classes. So if the model relies on the cheating label to make predictions, then it would have random prediction at test time because this is uh, the value of the cheating label is randomized. All right, so here's the um, result. So we tried the three models and here the X axis is the cheating rate. Larger cheating rate means that there is stronger spurious correlation between the cheating label um, and the, uh, uh, the ground truth label in our training data. And the y-axis here is the accuracy on the test set where the cheating label is randomized. So we compare our algorithm with MLE, which is the orange curve here. So we can see that as the cheating rate becomes larger, the performance of MLE drops significantly because it learns this uh, spurious correlation. Now, for our algorithm, we used two different biased models. Um, this blue curve, uses the hypothesis only bias model. So this model only makes, makes predictions only based on the hypothesis in the example. And we also tried uh, a Oracle bias model, which is the green line here. So uh, it's the Oracle bias model because it makes predictions based on cheating label, which is exactly uh, the spurious correlation injected into this data set here. So it captures uh, the actual distribution shift precisely. So that's why um, you see that using the Oracle bias model performance is better than using this hypothesis only bias model. Um, but both models uh, has better performance than MLE in terms, uh, because as the cheating rate increases, their performance do not drop significantly. Okay, so this, um, so comparing the blue curve and the green curve, we see that uh, one, uh, important factor in this algorithm is that better knowledge on the spurious correlation in the data sets really helps. And we will see this again uh, when we go to the uh, real data sets. Okay, so on the real data sets, we focused on the, uh, on real biases, we focus on the word overlap bias, uh, which basically says that the model relies on word overlap to predict impalement. So this phenomenon is discovered by uh, Mikhail et al. Uh, and they also proposed the data set called HANS, which tried to test this, uh, uh, th this behavior. So in both of these examples, we see that the premise on hypothesis is a high word order. In the first case, uh, it's entailment. So this is the majority pattern in our data set. And we see that on such examples, the model has very high uh, accuracy, actually close to 100%. But then in the, in the second case, where there's high word overlap, but the label is not entailment. The model has close to zero performance. Now you may wonder that maybe the second case is just harder to learn, 
Um, but it turns out that this is not due to model capacity because if you just take a few uh, examples from this group and find your own model on it, uh, the model can achieve high accuracy very quickly. So it's really because of the biases in the data set. All right, so let's now uh, look at the results from this uh, challenge is that hence. So this figure shows the, no, the performance on the non-entailment toward the challenge examples. And here we will show the performance on the entailment toward the typical uh, examples. So uh, you then, uh, if we use MLE to train our model, which basically minimize the average log loss on the training sets, we see that um, on this challenge example, the performance are close to zero. So if we use pre-trained model, it's uh, slightly better, um, but overall it's much worse than, when, than the performance of typical examples. So now if we use the um, residual fitting procedure to debias model, we see that the performance on the typical examples doesn't drop, but uh, it improves performance on the challenge examples. And here we tried three different bias models. The hypothesis is the only bias back on words bias model. And we also have a handcrafted bias model, uh, which has better knowledge, which is based on our knowledge of the spurious correlations in the data set from previous analysis papers. So if you use this, um, if you use better uh, bias model, we see that the performance can be uh, significantly improved, which shows the importance of um, this prior knowledge. Okay, so that is performance on the uh, challenge data set or the out of distribution data. So while we increase uh, performance on OD generalization, we also don't want the model uh, to drop on in distribution data. So here uh, we also test on the original MLI test set, which is in distribution. Uh, and this is the reference performance of the MLE trained model. And we see that uh, even though we improve out of distribution performance here on the in distribution data, uh, we do see some drop uh, here. So it seems there's some trade off between robustness and accuracy. Um, but one interesting observation is that on uh, the pre trained model, which is BERT, uh, it has uh, good performance on both in distribution and the challenge data. So in the second part, uh, we will investigate more into the effect of pre training here. Now, to summarize the first part, we showed that the prior knowledge of spurious correlation in a data set is very important. And based on that, we could learn from unbiased examples to uh, improve model robustness. However, one limitation here is that we see some trade-off between robust and in-distribution accuracy, which we will uh, investigate more next. Okay, I want to uh, stop and see if there's any questions on the first part before moving on. Hey, are there any questions in you saw? Uh, yeah, I do have a, a small question. Uh, so, mm -hmm. hi, Papa. I have a, a small question regarding the how you train the unbiased uh, classifier. So, uh, mm -hmm. did you just uh, simply uh, mask this spurious uh, text chunk in the sample, then you retrain it again as the unbiased classifier? Uh, um, yeah, that's a interesting interesting idea, but we we didn't train it that way. So basically, let me uh -huh. go to the Slide. Okay, so here how we trained it is, um, so in the output, so typically you have the output from your uh, your model and then you do back propagation. So here the output is the sum of the output of the device model and mm -hmm. uh, our current model. Then we do the standard back propagation or gradient descent. Uh, so here we don't really ch directly change the representation. Um, and in our analysis, we show that it actually uh, adjusts the gradient depending on how strong the first correlation on that example is. Oh, I see, I see. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so I also had a question. You know, uh, it really depends on um, how, how good you're characterizing the spurious correlation features, as you pointed out. I mean, if you could yeah. um, identify them perfectly, the residual should, uh, uh, completely nullify the effect, right? Um, yeah. But in the case where the the features are um, that that market are are sort of distributed over multiple features, or mm -hmm. um, you know, not uh, easily localized, I guess it would be a, a lot worse, right? 
So um, uh, in your example, you showed some cases of, of uh, vocabulary like negation being responsible. In other cases, an entailment data set um, based on word order. So um, have you and your co-authors sort of characterized um, for the different uh, sources of spurious correlation, how, how effective is this technique in, in capturing and uh, nullifying the effects? Um, yeah, so that's a good point. So it does really depends on your uh, prior knowledge on the spurious correlation. So here, so as long as you put, um, yeah, so as long as you could, uh, find a feature map that gives you the biased features. Uh, so let's say, so we focus on hypothesis only bias, the bag of words bias, and also some handcraft features, including uh, negation words and um, the word overlap rate. So, 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 so are asking about maybe there are some bias features that cannot be easily represented yeah, I mean, of course, that will be often the case because the network is going yeah. to do all of its parts rather than one localized part. But uh, yeah, I, I, I'm interested to know, let's say, for mm -hmm. example, between bag of words and ordering, right? And, and then specific vocabulary like negation. Uh, if we at least take a look at these two, two different components, uh, I guess it would be more effective in, in the case where you have specific words or lists of words that you I can see. point as uh, spurious correlation. It, would that be correct to characterize? Yeah, so, so, so let's say the, the spurious correlation is actually on some specific um, syntactic structure of the sentence, then mm -hmm. it's harder to, uh, it's harder to, characterize unless you know exactly what that structure is. Right. So in that case, I guess we don't have uh, complete knowledge on the spurious correlation in the data, so it will be more challenging. I see, I see. Okay, yeah, that's very good. Yeah. Um, yeah, so in, uh, so in the second part, I'll, uh, I guess I can briefly touch on that problem because here hmm. we don't assume uh, exact knowledge on the spurious correlation. Okay, great. Okay. Cool. Um, yeah, so in the second part, I'll talk about some uh, study uh, robustness of pre-trained language models. So at the end of the first part, we see that even though uh, for other models, there seems to be some trade-off uh, between robustness and accuracy on um, these pre-trained models, the trade-off is, uh, um, well, there's not, not much loss on in-distribution accuracy. So uh, we so the first thing we did here is to do a more systematic uh, study on this phenomenon to make sure that it's not just one uh, lucky case. Um, so here uh, we tested on textual entailment, um, and ECM is an unpretrained model, and then we also have a range of pretrained models with uh, increasing sizes. Uh, and here is the in-distribution performance. So as we know, if you use pre-trained model, obviously the in-distribution performance goes up. Uh, and then if you look at the out-of-distribution performance on the challenge data, in this case, hence, uh, the performance actually also goes up significantly. And then we also tested on paraphrase identification. Um, and we see that even though the trend is not as prominent as um, textual entailment, we do see some uh, improvement on both in-distribution and challenge data as uh, the pre-trained model becomes larger. So here one natural question is uh, whether these pre-trained models can extrapolate to out of distribution data. To answer this question, let's first look at our training data. Uh, as we mentioned, well, the majority of examples can be solved easily by some spurious correlation. Um, there exists a small amount of examples that cannot be solved. Uh, and these examples, uh, these minority examples actually resemble the, uh, our target data on the test distribution. So then we look into the real data sets like um, PENS and MLI. Uh, we also discovered that actually there is some, uh, a reasonable number of minority examples. For example, in MLI, there are more than 700 examples um, that has 100% overlap, but the label is not entailment. And similarly, in paraphrase identification, we also see uh, a couple hundred examples where they have the same bag of words, but the label is non-paraphrase. 
So this uh, made us come up with this hypothesis that maybe the pre-trained models generalize better from this minority examples in the benchmarks that resemble the challenge data uh, in, the, uh, in the target test distribution. So here our first observation is that um, the minority examples takes longer to learn and the performance on these minority examples in the training data uh, credits with performance on the challenge data. So here this uh, uh, start dash line uh, shows the depth accuracy of the minority examples. Um, and this line shows the, depth, uh, the, the overall depth accuracy. So even though the depth accuracy already uh, saturated after three epochs, which is usually when we early stop uh, the training here. But the, the accuracy on the minority examples continue to improve. And again, we see, and when we look at the um, in-distribution test data and the challenge test data, we see similar uh, behavior. So on the, the in-distribution performance plateaus after three epochs, but then on the challenge data, it continues to improve. So this seems to show that there's some correlation between uh, performance of these minority examples and uh, the challenge data. So our second, uh, in our second experiment, we try to remove the minority examples in the training data and see how it affects the challenge data performance. So first, this uh, so so different figures shows the different pre-trained models. Uh, so from left to right, we again have uh, increasing. Uh, increasingly large pre-trained models. So now if we remove the random, random examples in training data, which is shown by this uh, orange line, we see that the accuracy doesn't really drop. So with these big models, we just remove some examples, it doesn't really matter. But now if you start to remove the minority examples in the training data, we see that the performance drops significantly for our models. And in fact, uh, if 6% of data is removed, uh, the accuracy of these uh, pre-trained models is uh, close to random on the challenge data. So this shows that the pre-trained models uh, do not just extrapolate to challenge data uh, without any uh, minority examples in training data, but instead what they're good at is um, improving the robustness to data imbalance. So even with um, a couple of hundred minority examples, it can uh, generalize and learn that pattern effectively. Okay, there is also a side observation. So at the beginning, we see that the improvements on uh, hands, which is the NIHM data, is much larger than improvement um, pulse. So we also investigate a little bit. Um, and it turns out that uh, the hands data set is generated by templates. So it's relatively very easy to learn. And we see that if we just tune on this data set, the model reaches 100% pretty quickly. Um, but this pulse is automatically generated with uh, human filtering. So uh, it's harder to learn, and that's why. Um, so, so maybe that's why uh, the pre, with, with pre-training, we still don't see good generalization on pause-like examples. So perhaps uh, not so surprisingly, this result shows that different uh, predict patterns require different amounts of training data. So just rely on pre-training uh, cannot solve all of our robustness problems. So now, so far, we, ha we have seen that um, the distribution shift happens when these minority examples becomes majority at test time. And in the first part, we use residual feeding to kind of upweight these minority examples at the cost of performance on other examples. This is one uh, limitation. Um, but one nice thing we have just observed on these pre-trained models is that with more generic data in the pre-training stage, it can improve generalization uh, from these minority examples, which doesn't really hurt performance on other examples. So then this motivates us to find a better way of using generic data to mitigate the robustness accuracy trade-off. So here, the, our key idea is to improve generalization from minority examples by transferring knowledge from related tasks through multitasking. And our setup is uh, pretty straightforward. We have a shared for encoder plus uh, linear task specific classifiers. And uh, we tested uh, texture entailment and paraphrase identification. Uh, and for each of these target data sets, we have um, auxiliary data sets. 
And basically, we did a mix and match of uh, NLI and uh, perfect identification data sets. Okay, so now with multitasking learning, let's look at the performance on the in distribution data and challenge data. We remember that uh, we want the model to perform well on both in distribution and out of distribution data. So for single task learning, um, we see that uh, on the challenge data, the performance uh, is much lower than on the in distribution data. And now with uh, multitasking learning, we could improve performance on the out of distribution data without sacrificing performance on the in-distribution data. And this is on um, the BERT-based model. And now even if we move to Roberta-based, which is trained on much larger uh, pre-training data, the improvement still holds, and especially on um, pause, uh, where just with pre-training, we don't see a lot of uh, improvement. So it shows that uh, multitasking learning uh, with the help of data from related tasks can improve robustness on top of uh, pre-training. Okay, so how does uh, multitasking learning help? So here we did some uh, ablation study to see uh, which auxiliary data is uh, most useful. So the first two rows show the baseline results for this is single task learning. This is uh, using multitasking learning and we can improve the challenge data performance. So now if we try to remove um, examples from either the, so we can remove examples from the target data set or we can remove examples from these auxiliary data sets. And we can either remove random examples or minority examples. And we try different combinations. Um, the first observation is that on, the, on in distribution data, it really doesn't matter. And, uh, but uh, out of distribution data, we see that if we remove the minority examples from QQP, which is the uh, main target data set here, uh, the performance drops significantly. So this shows that uh, multitasking learning, uh, similar to pre-training, still improves generalization from minority examples in our original training data to improve robustness. Okay, so in this section, our focus is on uh, mitigating the trade-off between in-distribution and robust accuracy. So we have observed that pre-training helps generalization from minority examples. Um, and using this idea of adding more generic data to improve generalization, we showed that multitasking learning could be an effective way uh, to do this in addition to pre-training. Okay, so I'll stop here for a second to chat for questions. Do we have questions from the audience? Yeah, I, I have a quick question. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, you, you're using uh, multitask learning over multiple data sets to enhance robustness. Um, and I'm wondering whether uh, you guys have thought about what happens when you distill that type of knowledge down to a smaller uh, model. Does these uh, types yeah. of things uh, help uh, still uh, or uh, are, are, do they still scale linearly with the amount of um, uh, domains and data sets uh, tried on, or are there more effective ways to make sure that the distillation process uh, still retains the gains uh, that uh, come from the robustness of using pre-trained models and joint learning? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. Um, I have not thought about that. So, so here, basically, uh, we want to see if model size is important for learning these uh, robust features. Um, yeah, I would be curious to, to see it. Um, my guess is that it would retain some robustness capability of the large model um, because many of the parameters in this model are redundant. So uh, I guess what really matters is, so if the smaller model um, can simulate the performance of the larger model, I would guess that it also uh, retains the robustness properties. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, but I'd be curious to see. And uh, secondly, because you tried a couple combinations, uh, sort of like a Cartesian product of the data sets, did you notice that some data sets, especially if they're farther or closer, I mean, mm -hmm. it's hard to say exactly how you would characterize that. In our group, we use uh, domain divergence for that. Um, 
but uh, have you noticed whether um, the similarity between the tasks or the similarity between the genres of tasks uh, uh, correlate to better or worse performance? I guess, you know, we would, uh, I would hypothesize, you know, the further the data set is from the original, uh, you know, test distribution, the better it is uh, in terms of in, uh, creating a more robust uh, distribution of data to learn from. Right. So, yeah, so we did do some uh, simple, so, so we didn't use any domain divergence metric. Uh, I think it would be interesting to try. So what we, uh, what we did do is some very simple ablation studies. So we have three, let's say we have three auxiliary data sets here. We could remove each of them and see what's their effect on the final uh, downstream performance. Um, so we expected that Hans, which is a similar challenge data set that's exploiting this word overlap bias, could have larger impact on downstream performance. Performance, but the, it turns out that uh, actually these two data sets has a larger impact just because. But then size, data set size is another confounder here. So it's possible because these are larger data sets, they have bigger influence. Um, yeah, so I think it would be interesting to scale this up and uh, see whether different tasks have different uh, uh, impact on the results. So for example, if you downsample the MLI and SLNI mm -hmm. data sets to around the same size yeah. as Hans, do you expect that the Hans data set would show outsized performance gains? Yeah, possibly. So that that would be my expectation because um, that actually resembles the uh, the pause data. Right. Right. Okay. That's very helpful to know. Do we have other questions from the audience? Okay. Maybe uh, we'll save the rest of the questions for after the final third of the talk. So uh, yeah, please go ahead. Thanks. Yeah, so in the last part, I want to uh, talk about some recent work um, uh, investigating the effectiveness uh, or rather ineffectiveness of the counterfactual augmented data. And this is a joint work with uh, Nitish. So in, in the first two, in the first two sections, they either try to focus on a subset of our training data or augment some related data. Another approach is to directly augment examples that um, similar to the minority examples. So here, uh, th this idea is proposed by Kaushik et al. Um, and they used uh, cross-sourcing to identify the robust features in a sentence. For example, given this uh, sentence from sentiment classification, election is a highly fascinating and thoroughly captivating spirit or drama. And then they ask people to edit the sentence minimally in order to flip the label. So in this case, we could change fascinating the expected, captivating to my numbing, so the label that becomes selective. And the assumption here is that through this uh, intervention, it would tell us which stance actually caused this label to change. So then uh, this, this stance should be uh, the so-called causal stance versus, uh, as opposed to the spirit features. So now the hypothesis is that if we train on this counterfactually augmented data or CAD, it will lead to robust models that use the causal features, uh, which will generalize better to OD data. So we thought this was, uh, was a very interesting idea, um, but then we also see some mixed results using CADs to improve OD generalization. So in the first paper, they showed that CAD doesn't lead to better performance uh, on OD data. Uh, specifically, they try to transfer from SNLI to MLI, which is already a, a relatively simple case, but then uh, augmenting this current factor data doesn't help. And, and then people also showed that on question answering, the unaugmented data is better when the data set size and annotation costs are controlled. And, and uh, finally, the same author, um, Kaushik et al. also had some positive results showing that the stands identified by CAD are actually uh, very useful features because now if you remove the noise saying this uh, stands identified by CAD, it hurts performance uh, compared to noisy random uh, stands. So then the question is, if CAD does reveal useful features, why aren't they helpful in the first two cases? And in, our, in some of our prelim, preliminary experiments, we also see that uh, it doesn't always help OD generalization. 
so we investigated uh, this problem a little bit and to understand the, the problem, let's first look at this uh, toy example. So here we only have two sentiment classification examples. The book is good, which is positive, and the movie is boring, which is negative. Now, if you just learn a naive-based model on these two sentences, uh, we would have positive weights, uh, good and negative and boring, which is, uh, which is good. But then we also have positive and negative weights on book and movie respectively, which is uh, a spurious feature because we only have two examples and uh, these objects are correlated with the label. So now if we do counterfactual augmentation, for example, we could edit the first sentence to the book is not good and turn that into negative or uh, change the movie is boring to the movie is fascinating and now we have a positive sentence. So now if we train model on this augmented data, um, it does debias these two spurious features like book and movie. However, it, it also somehow debias good because this is actually a feature we want to have positive weights and now it have uh, uh, zero weights. And the reason is that in the first case, we didn't perturb uh, this word good. Instead, we just add a negation word. So if we don't perturb that, um, the model will not be able to learn that by comparing these two examples. The, the only difference is negation words. So that's what the model learned here. And this uh, two example shows that the unintrusive robust features cannot be learned from CAD. So using this augmented data uh, can limit what the model learn. So then we also investigate the realistic CAD data set. And our hypothesis here is that the under diverse edits would limit the effectiveness of CAD. So what we did is to categorize the edits into multiple categories based on some simple rules, such as uh, whether it's changing a quantifier or a negation word for uh, replacing a specific word, et cetera. And we would train on specific perturbations and then test its generalization to other types of perturbations. Um, and all the training set has uh, the same data size here. So the first row shows the baseline. So this is just using the standard uh, examples from our benchmark data sets. And now if we train this uh, specific perturbations, uh, our first observation is that if we train and test on the same type of perturbations, uh, the performance is the best. But then if we look at uh, the unmatched test sets where we train and test on different perturbations, uh, the performance is much worse than our matched test set. And also in some cases like the red numbers, the worse than the baseline SLI performance. So these are cases where if we augment examples, it doesn't work better than just using the uh, uh, cross-source data. And in this uh, experiment, we control the data size, but increase the number of edit types in our training data. And we can see that as we increase the diversity of the edit types in our training data, even though uh, the total number of examples is the same, the performance goes up significantly, uh, which seems to suggest that the aggregate effective data size of this counterfactual augmented data is really the number of features that got intervened. So given that result, one natural question is, if we collect more and more counterfactual augmented data, uh, would we naturally have more diverse perturbations or edits so that we can improve the performance? So here we show the learning curve, um, both CAD and uh, SNI, and we test on OLD data, which is MLI in this case. So this um, uh, red curve is the learning curve on CAD and the uh, the green curve is the learning curve on the SNI data set. So we see that in the low data region, CAD is very effective because even with a couple of examples, you can easily identify the useful stance. But as we increase the number of CAD examples, it seems to plateau, uh, whereas increasing numbers of SNI examples still improves the models. So in the high data region, CAD is not that useful. And another surprising observation is that even though origin, the, the intention of using counterfactual augmentation is to debias the spurious correlations in the data set, what we observe is that it 
can amplify the existing spirit correlations in the data. So here on the NI data, um, we know that there's some negation bias. So we take examples where there is a negation word in the hypothesis. And now we look at the label distribution, uh, either the seed examples as an example or the cat example. And we see that in both cases, there is more contradiction example, um, which is a reflection of the, oops, sorry. Uh, which is the reflection of the negation bias. Uh, and on CAD, actually this, uh, uh, this distribution is more skewed. And similarly, if you look at examples where it's high word overlap, um, it's very likely to be entailment on both uh, data. And again, it's amplified um, the current factory offensive data. Okay, so to summarize this part, uh, here we show that uh, current factor of data is an effective way to identify useful text sense uh, for various natural language understanding tasks. Um, but it may also limit what the model can learn if certain robust features are not perturbed in this process. So even uh, with current factor data augmentation, we still need better ways to ensure uh, the diversity or the coverage of the perturbations. Okay, so to summarize um, the talk, here we tried different methods to uh, guard against spurious correlations by making better use of the a small amount of current examples in the original data set. So all these approaches would require some knowledge on the uh, predictive patterns in the data, either from um, experts or from uh, crowd workers. So one interesting question is how to discover different predictive patterns uh, automatically without uh, domain knowledge. And then another takeaway from the last part is that we might want to investigate into uh, better cross-sourcing protocols that improve diversity of our data sets. Okay, so with that, uh, I can conclude the talk and take any more questions. Okay, yeah, uh, thanks so much for the talk. Uh, I think it's very interesting. There are lots of uh, overlaps of our group. So I think Yi Song probably has oh. some questions. <laughs> uh, I have some questions as well, but I'll, I'll, I'll uh, maybe we will first ask the audience. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a couple members that might have questions. The, so um, does anyone have any questions that they'd like to ask? <laughs> Okay, maybe uh, we'll start with Lee Song. Oh, oh yeah, uh, so uh, hi, uh, thank you for a very nice talk. So um, my question is regarding the uh, negative results of this CAT model. So uh, the question is rather generic. So uh, mm -hmm. the, do you think the negative result comes from the possible reason that when we change the sentence, the, the sentence is not a very complete, right? So let's say if we augment a sentence or we mask some spurious pattern, then the sentence is not complete. It's not a, a U-form sentence. Then that's the reason the uh, the, the result is negative. Uh, do you have any opinion on that? Uh, so could you elaborate uh, the incompleteness? What do you mean by sentence? Is oh, complete? yeah, sure. So say if we mask the negation words not, right? So then the sentence is not complete, right? So we have, uh, I mean, the maybe the sentence is not gra grammatically correct anymore. Yeah. So. so oh, that's I see. I yeah. see. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So here we don't uh, we don't mask it, um, but we change the we edit this uh, span into some other words. So um, uh -huh. the resulting uh -huh. sentence is still complete, uh, still but they did. Okay. So, so I, I guess in there, maybe you're referring to this result. So when they try to yeah, analyze yeah. the effectiveness of CAD, what yeah. they did is to noise the sentence. Like, uh -huh. uh, I forgot the details, but I think they replaced it with some uh, other phrases that also fit into the context and then they show that there's larger drop in performance. Uh -huh. I see, great, thanks. Okay, so I had a, a couple questions. I think this is really interesting work that seems to blend very well with your your second part of your talk. So uh, if, if we were to compose the second part of your talk with the data augmentation, 
um, it seems to uh, suggest that you, know, you could possibly pick or pay attention to uh, counterfactual uh, instances or ones that are mm -hmm. close to counterfactual in a, a opposing data set and maybe mm -hmm. uh, weight those more or, or somehow uh, pay more attention to them. Um, and uh, maybe these are also the examples that might be outsized, uh, outsized, have an outsized impact uh, during the training when you're, you're doing joint learning. Have you uh, any uh, current work or um, thought about these these places where your third and the second work intersect? Um, you mean you mean try to find uh, maybe there are naturally occurring counterfactual examples in our training already, so we could try to find close examples with different labels. Yeah, because I mean, uh, yeah. in counterfactual generation, you're generating mm -hmm. uh, new data examples, yeah. right? Uh, but they also naturally occur in, in some ways, or you, you have examples within another data set um, that are more similar mm. to counterfactual examples uh, and, and some that are oh, less okay. similar. So I'm wondering if, if there's some way to grade um, the, the, the data set uh, from another, um, uh, yeah, from another data set and say, I, I think this, this particular example would be better mm. uh, and it's still naturally occurring, right? So uh, mm -hmm. you, you don't have um, necessarily so many problems with it uh, because uh, in, in some ways you, you're, you're pointing out that the counterfactual uh, generation can go overboard, right? So there's the mm -hmm. case where uh, uh, right. you're introducing or augment, uh, uh, amplifying, I should say, not augmenting, amplifying um, spurious correlation in certain cases, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very interesting point. So, uh, yeah, I think so. I, I was worrying that if you find counterfactual examples in the, let's say, in LI, there might not be that many examples. Uh, but I guess if you try also try to get counterfactual or close close counterfactual examples in other data sets uh, and transfer those knowledge, that could be very interesting. Um, yeah, because also the robust features, even if it's from a different task, could still uh, be very useful for our target task. Right. I mean, you're you're trying to identify features through counterexample, mm -hmm. uh, counterfactual yeah. example generation, but perhaps because the counterfactual generation um, um, goes overboard in some ways to to mm -hmm. generate things right, that right. are too too artificial, then we can go to a large data set like Common Crawl. Uh, and then mm -hmm. pull out sentences that are similar uh, to what mm -hmm. you want and then augment the data uh, in, in that way to, to show more robustness, but at least it wouldn't be art artificially generated to too much of an extent. Um, so I'm also wondering if, if you analyze the counterfactually generated sentences to see whether, uh, you know, ones that uh, create the spurious correlation or augment those, um, they are problematic from a human's perspective. Like you can see that those are um, not, not properly generated counterfactual uh, examples. Mm -hmm. Mm. So here, okay, maybe maybe I didn't make this. So so here the examples are generated by humans. Yes. Okay. Um, so mostly, uh, yeah. So I guess Nitish looking into some examples because they so the original authors also did uh, very strict quality control. I, I guess mm. their first batch of data probably not that not, not so good, um, but at least the published ones. Uh, when we look at that, it's mostly reasonable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I guess, uh, so So for this biases, it's possible that when you ask them to minimally add the sentence to, let's say, make it from entailment to neutral, they could still insert the negation word. Um, so that cannot be prevented. Right. So yeah, maybe this is one artifact due to this. Uh, cross-sourcing procedure. Uh, as you suggested, if you try to look for this in some naturally occurring sentences, uh, that might be less, a less of a problem. Mm. Yeah, um, I guess uh, related to that is, you know, um, when you're augmenting uh, the data, you're amplifying uh, certain uh, parts more, but, um, I wonder, uh, similar to in your first uh, part, whether there's a, 
um, some type of effectiveness uh, ratio that you can look at uh, based on the size of the data set that you're augmenting, right? Because um, in, in doing CAD, you, you have um, the capability to augment a lot more, right? Um, because you can generate these uh, on the fly through crowdsourcing, or even um, if, if you don't uh, use crowdsourcing, do this uh, semi-automatically, right? So uh, it's possible to scale up the, the creation of CAD um, arbitrarily yeah. large, right? So, yeah, uh, there's a yeah. Go ahead. Uh, so, so there's the possibility that you can generate a, a whole range of examples at, at different scales, and to take a look at the the trade off in performance there, which you did do, right? You said that after a certain um, after a certain amount, uh, it seems to plateau mm -hmm. in effectiveness compared right. to uh, using uh, additional data. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So. So there is a recent paper from, um, I think UW. So they try to automatically generate this uh, counterfactual data to, to scale it up. So uh, they learn a generator from existing uh, counterfactual data mm -hmm. and augment more examples and ask humans to label those. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so that seems to be a, a efficient way to scale it up because you, uh, you could imagine that if you ask humans to label a pair is uh more efficient than asking them to authoring this text. <laughs> right yeah classification is a lot easier than generation at least for humans yeah <laughs> <laughs> great uh other questions from the floor uh hi I have, I have a question uh so uh in that perspective these uh spurious features are kind of similar to the adversarial example that uh, some input can cause unexpected output. And uh, so I have two questions. So is there a actual uh, resemblance between these two type of thing? And uh, the other question is, uh, can we uh, find, can we find the spurious correlations using some uh, machine learning models from the data? Or are all the spurious correlations manually detected by people? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so for the first question, um, so for counterfactual data, we mainly change the, the standards and we expect the prediction to, to also change. If the model doesn't change its prediction, then that means it's undersensitive to, to these perturbations. Where, whereas in adversary examples, the model is oversensitive to some uh, perturbations and some nuisance tech expense. Um, so one is label flipping perturbation, the other is label preserving. Uh, perturbation. So I guess um, I think they are complementary. So for counterfactual examples, if you look at this example, this pair, it tells you which stance are important, which causes label to change. Now we could also generate some uh, label preserving perturbations, and then if you look at that pair, it, it tells us which stance are uh, not important for the label, or there are some nuisance tech stance in this example. Yeah, I guess. Um, Thank you. I yeah, think that, that answered my first mind. question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. So for the right for the second question, whether uh, whether spurious correlations are can be discovered by models automatically, or they're always uh, revealed by humans, right? Um, yeah. So for for that question, I think. So far, most spurious correlations, uh, especially the, the ones that we um, we used, uh, we focused on, are discovered by uh, analysis. So uh, maybe domain experts thought that the model might be relying on this to make predictions, then they create examples to, to verify that hypothesis. Um, uh, it's also possible to, uh, I have seen some work that try to clustering the uh, representations, like the last uh, last layer representation from the model. And then you can manually go through each clusters to see if there's any prominent predictive pattern and, and then identify the first correlations. Uh, but still that involves some human work to interpret the data. Yeah, I think, I think, I think that's the major difficulty maybe in this problem. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. 
Great. So do we have additional questions? Uh, Yun Xiang. Uh, hi, Prof. Uh, thanks for your talk. And I, uh, I have a question regarding to um, the, the performance drop on the I aligned test of CAT, right? So mm -hmm. um, I, I'm wondering what, uh, whether this issue is kind of a general issue or just a specific issue on the CAT data set re released by, by the author, because I've seen uh, there are other CAT data set like the Polyjuice on this year's ACL. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm not sure whether their data set suffers from the, 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 the same issue. Yeah, so in addition to, to this specific um, CAT data set by Kaoshi et al, we also, uh, we, we also tested on the bullying question answering data sets uh, collected by another group. And in general, we see similar trends. So um, if the, the training data has, uh, let's say, a, a single perturbation, it doesn't generalize to uh, other perturbations. So, um, and the regarding the data set you mentioned um, about polyjuice, so I think it would have uh, the problem wouldn't be so be, because polyjuice is learned from a bunch of different augmented data sets, uh, and also during generation you could try to diversify the text through uh, sampling during decoding. So I suppose it would be more diverse. Uh, the this uh, this CAD data and um, the Boolean Q data we we tested. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so I, I agree that uh, the results are uh, data set specific, but the main thing is that um, you know if you increase the diversity of the perturbations in the data set, we should expect to see uh, better performance. Okay, great. Uh, other questions? Okay, um, let us, uh, I think, end the public part of the seminar now. So um, let's first thank our speaker. Thank you, Prof. Hehe, for uh, presenting your work today. No, we, thanks for having me. We really appreciate it. And um, we'll end the recording here.